Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Today, Stephanie Desmond sits down with Megan O'Rourke, a science journalist and the author of a New York Times bestselling book on chronic illness. They discuss the silent epidemic of illnesses like O'Rourke's that are hard to diagnose and the parallels for people who are emerging with disabling symptoms of long COVID. Let's listen. Megan O'Rourke, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. So I wanted to start by having you tell our listeners a little bit about your New York Times bestselling book, The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness. I know that you talk not just about your own struggle with a chronic illness, but sort of the struggle that you went through to even get it defined as an illness. So if you could tell us about your book, that would be great. Yeah. So my book, as you've um, already intimated, tells my own journey of getting mysteriously sick over a period of nearly two decades, actually, and gradually uncovering what was wrong with me. But it, it took more than a decade to come to a diagnosis. And then it turned out that I actually had a cluster of diagnoses that were in some ways interrelated. And these diagnoses were, you know, in the realm of autoimmune disease and um, what's called dysautonomia or problems with the autonomic nervous system. And they got me really interested in the question of why had it been so hard for me in this hyper diagnostic age that we live in to get doctors to believe that I was sick in the first place and then to find answers? What was going on that made that journey such a challenging one in which, again, for nearly a decade, I really suffered without anyone quite crediting what I was saying about my own symptoms and being met with a lot of, you know, moments of doctors saying, well, maybe this is caused by stress or maybe you're suffering from anxiety. So that question led me to take up the research in the book, which I conducted over, again, nearly a decade, which really looks into what I call the silent epidemic of chronic illnesses that are, in particular, diseases triggered by, in some sense, problems with the immune system or encounters with a pathogen like a virus or bacteria. And this emerging vanguard of medicine, which is looking at the ways in which some people may encounter, say, a virus and simply never get better, right? Something we're now seeing vividly dramatized before us during the pandemic. I wanted to ask you about that. I know that you've been writing about long COVID. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about what long COVID is and how it relates to what you have been through? Yeah. So... There's a lot we don't know about long COVID, but I can tell you that, you know, long COVID has come to be the term, obviously, for people who have an experience of an acute infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and then just don't get better. And the ways in which people aren't getting better can really vary from person to person, but we're seeing clusters of things like fatigue, brain fog, racing hearts, breathlessness, uh, very specific symptoms like the sensation of heavy feet or legs. Uh, Then of course there's things like loss of taste and smell, but they're really clustering around these hard to measure symptoms like extreme fatigue, um, dysautonomia and, and more. So there's a number of theories about what's causing it. And there are some things we know now right? Um, We know that there are sometimes micro clots, tiny, tiny blood clots in the blood of people with long COVID. Some people with long COVID seem to be developing autoimmune diseases after um, encountering the virus. Others have dysautonomia or of something that looks a lot like something called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia. And it is a big mouthful of words, but it basically means that your body isn't doing a good job of regulating your kind of autonomic nervous system isn't working very well. So when you stand up, blood isn't getting to your brain, your heart races in a sort of futile attempt to stabilize you. So there's a lot of things that look quite a lot like that in long COVID patients. 
And then much, much more that I'm not even getting at. There's this theory that it persists in some patients. Scientists have found pockets of virus in some patients. So there's a lot to look into. And I think a lot to, we'll need to dig into the question of, is long COVID an umbrella term that describes several pathways to ongoing illness that people experience after they get the virus? Mm -hmm. I know that a big thing that you talk about in your book is sort of being heard and being believed. And that that's a real, a much bigger barrier, I think, that other people can understand. Do you see similarities with sort of the long COVID folks or do you feel like they're being listened to? I do see a lot of similarities. I, I think that there's one thing that's really singular about long COVID and that is that where a lot of the kinds of patients I'm talking about have very mysterious onset to their illness. It's not always clear. Like in an autoimmune disease, you don't know the moment you get the autoimmune disease often. Some patients think that, you know, a virus helped trigger it, but often it's a sort of amorphous thing in which your health is gradually changing over time. Something similar for some patients who have myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome, right, which is another really overlooked and marginalized condition I talk about. But what's different about long COVID is that we have this mass event where just you know, millions of people got this virus and then millions of people didn't recover. And it's a very clear origin, right? There's sort of a very clear etiology, as we would say, for the beginning of long COVID. So I think that is helping shine a light on it in a new way. And I think the fact that some people early on who got it became really powerful advocates and really good at using the internet to draw attention to this fact. And finally, the fact that a lot of people with long COVID are actually healthcare workers who got long COVID early on because they were among the first to contract the virus while caring for people in the first wave. And so I think that is helping medicine, which has been you know, as I say in the book, sort of resistant to these diseases in many places, or certainly a lot of doctors aren't really educated in med school to help treat patients with these hard to measure, poorly understood conditions. I think there is the sense in which some people that I've interviewed are saying, you know, this has really changed my mindset because now I'm seeing my best friend, you know, who's also a doctor suffering in this way. You know, it shouldn't take that to get them to believe in patients, but it, but it has, I think, taken that. Do you think the ripple effect will be that folks with you know different chronic diseases, will they be heard? Will they be listened to? I don't know, right? Because you know, to go back to your question, are people being heard? I mean, sometimes people are being heard with long COVID and sometimes they're not. I was just talking to a woman who was explaining to me that she's gone all over, you know, she lives in rural America and just it's been hard to find a doctor who has been following long COVID and credits her. So I don't think there's any magic. This is not a silver bullet, right? It's not going to change overnight. But I think that with concerted effort and advocacy, there's an opportunity at least to have long COVID help shine a light more broadly on these chronic conditions. And what I can say is that some researchers I've been speaking to at Yale, at Mount Sinai, weren't working on anything like this before and now are deeply working on long COVID. And they are actually really interested in the question of how what they're learning might help patients with dysautonomia, ME-CFS, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disease. So there is a cohort of people out there really trying to I think help a lot of people. Again, the question is, what do we do with this funding in this moment? We can't do the same things we've done before. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to ask, no one's really sure how many people end up with long COVID. I know that personally, I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm afraid of long COVID because I've been vaccinated and boosted. What are we sort of facing as a nation and a healthcare system with this long COVID, which could end up being a substantial group of folks? Yeah. One researcher I was talking to was saying, you know, we are on the precipice or we're in the middle of really what could be considered a mass disabling event, right? Rain, the, the statistics are really hard to pin down for all kinds of reasons, namely that we, you know, again, don't have great measurements and we don't know if everyone who thinks they have long COVID had COVID, though there's a lot of evidence that helps us sort of separate people into groups of people who probably really never got to get tested for the virus, but probably do have long COVID, et cetera. But, you know, we need in this moment to rethink the delivery of care to those patients and really make sure that we are able societally to help support this just extraordinary number of people. Even if you take the conservative estimates, it's something like 
10 to 30 percent of people who weren't vaccinated were ending up with long COVID. And then there's a lot of estimates that say vaccination kind of halves your chance of long COVID. But to your point, it's terrifying, right? It's unclear who gets it. We don't really know how to prevent it. I think one reason that often in the discourse around COVID, we just don't see long COVID mentioned that much by public health officials is that it's just too frightening to people and people want to get back to life. But if you really keep top of mind the fact that like you could at any moment have a virus that might permanently disable you, that's a really, really hard thing to look at. But we do have to look at it. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about sort of your story arc. So this is not a tidy story. This is not Megan goes out and finds out what she has and she gets a drug and she's better. So I wanted you to sort of just leave our listeners with an understanding of the trajectory of where your illness has gotten and how you are today. Right. So the journey of the book, as I say in the beginning of the book, I mean, you've just nailed it, is really to sort of actively resist the tidiness of most illness narratives. The stories we tend to tell about illness in this country are stories of dramatic recovery or almost like spiritualized succumbing. I always think of Love Story, that famous novel and book about a young woman who dies of cancer and is in some ways ennobled by it. But the chronically ill person lives in a really different story, right, which is messy, repetitive, even chaotic. In my case, I really have um, not just one diagnosis too, but a cluster of diagnoses. And I live in this way in which I'll be sick and get better and sick and get better. And part of the work of the book then is to take the reader on the journey that I went on from believing at the beginning that I would just was trying very hard to just get an answer and get better, right? And I thought there would be maybe one diagnosis and a pill that I took and this would all be put to rest. And in fact, as I learned over the years, what I had was much more complicated and entangled and necessitated me really rethinking what health was and coming to have a different relationship, both with my body and I think with medicine itself. So in the end, I was diagnosed with Lyme disease that had gone undiagnosed for you know almost two decades, about 15 years. And either because of that or you know along with that, I have an autoimmune disease, I have dysautonomia. So I live with this cluster of symptoms and diagnoses. Um, there's a genetic one called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And the more that I researched in the book, the more that I understood you know, it all seemed so improbable to me at the beginning. How could I really have all these things wrong with me? Am I not in some sense making this up? But in fact, these things often coexist for reasons that you you can find out more in the book. But I was treated for Lyme disease and I'm doing a lot better than I was. I, you know, I'm pretty much at like 60 to 80% most days and I can have a life. I had children, I, you know, have a job. And when I was at my sickest, I was not working and I was pretty much bedridden and really had lost the hope of a future. Well, I'm glad that this ends on a hopeful note. It does not on a hopeful note, right? I'm not better in the conventional sense, but I'm living with illness in a new sense. Yeah, and able to be here and write this book. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening.